You're tuned in to the only all sports talk network in the Middle East, IsraelSportsRadio.com. Back here on Lewis Live, and it's a pleasure to bring our next guest, a, a fan favorite here at Israel Sports Radio. He's uh, been delivering a lot of great news about uh, college football and uh, very lucky the past couple of years of where he's worked at. And to talk about the big BCS title game last night, good friend of the program, Adam Bagney. Adam, how you doing out there, man? Hey, what's going on, guys? It's been a while. Good to talk to you again. Yeah, it's been uh, too long. My apologies. Again, uh, Pete Shepard, it took uh, too long to call back, and and you as well, I apologize, but it's great to have you back on. Uh, Let's just get right into it. Uh, I mean, I did not think LSU would be shut out. Um, I mean, I... I you did. didn't pick them even to win, okay? I was the only one who picked them to, to win Alabama. in this building. Yeah, yeah I picked uh, I picked LSU to win. First time there's been a shutout in BCS history. Uh, the last time uh, I would say a team played this bad as far as not scoring a lot of points. Got to go back to Florida State when they scored two points against Oklahoma uh, for the two, in the 2001 title game. What do you make of this? How come LSU was not able to put any points on the board against the Crimson Tide? Yeah, you know, it's shocking. And, and Alabama's defense, and, you know, Nick Saban, he's from the Belichick tree, and every uh, every team that he's put together in Alabama has been based around the defense. But this may be uh, arguably one of the best defenses we've ever seen, to be honest with you, in college football. And that was probably their best performance. The thing is, LSU, I think a lot of people looked at that football game and said, wow, LSU, man, their offense is just completely inept. But this is an offense that... Uh, beat nine ranked teams or teams that were ranked at the time that they played in this year. Uh, they won tough games on the road. They put 40 on Oregon. Now, Oregon's not known for their defense. but still Pac-10, uh, you know, Pac-10 opponents. So I think the fact that they did not score a point, that they didn't even cross midfield, what was it, until late uh, in the third quarter or late in the, early in the fourth quarter, uh, it's just unbelievable and it says a lot about that Alabama defense. It's pretty surprising, that's for sure. Well, one thing that that wasn't surprising to me, at least, was that Alabama won. I had picked them winning actually twenty to sixteen. I did not think that it was going to be as much of a snoozer of a game as it ended up being. Seven was it like seven field goal attempts, one touchdown, a missed extra point seemed to be the only highlight of the game. But oh, the, 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 that's right, the, the block one. But I, I gotta ask you though, what? Why, where did LSU go wrong on the offensive side of the football? Uh, I don't think they took enough chances. And it was interesting because Mike Gundy came out uh, yesterday, uh, or I believe it was late last night or early this morning, the head coach at Oklahoma State, and he said, man, you know, I wish we really, we really got a shot. We had a shot at this national title game. We would have thrown the ball 50 times. We would have gone down the field. I think that – Les Miles' game plan, especially late in the game, was very conservative. I thought that, uh, you know, we saw him punt it away on the fourth down with about seven minutes left, but they still needed three scores. Uh, it was interesting. I think LSU just didn't take enough chances. They respected Alabama's defense almost too much. I mean, and I so it was a great defense, but they should have taken more chances down the field. They weren't very risky, and I think in the end that sort of cost them. Do you think that they did not get Reuben Randall involved enough? Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. Is that is that something you noticed as well? Yes, it seemed like he was the ty- he's the type of player that could really change the entire approach to a game, the entire outlook on a game, and it seemed like they just let him be and didn't really try almost to get him no involved. Question. Nope. No question, no question about it. But you, you got, I got to give my, my props to Trent Richardson. He was just a beast in this game, and he really was, for the entire season, really, with Alabama, carried this team to where it ended up becoming the solo, non-shared national title champions. And what yeah. I, I got to, you know, you, you got to tip your hat and give credit to where credit's due. Nick Saban, the first coach to win three BCS titles in the BCS era, and really, it almost seemed like Tim Tebow was on the field in the form of Alabama quarterback A.J. McCarron. It almost seemed like, you know, McCarron is not known to be the one to throw a lot, to really take control of the game, and he was very efficient. He was solid. Yeah, well, I'll say this about, I'll say this about McCarron. He didn't do anything spectacular. Uh, but he managed the game, and he didn't make huge mistakes, and that's the reason why Alabama won the game. You know, you mentioned Nick Saban, and it's interesting because I think this game, you, you talk about cementing the legacy. Uh, I, I think he really did that with this third championship. You know, this is going to be the last stop 
on the Nick Saban train for sure, uh, you know, I think in his college coaching career. And the fact that he won a third, the fact that he did it. Remember, he made Alabama competitive just after a couple of years. Uh, and I think it, it says a lot to his legacy that he's going to go down probably as one of the better college uh, coach, coaches in the history of college football. And, and Trent Richardson, a lot of us down in Alabama, I'm not sure if you guys recall this, but a couple of years ago, the first time around when Alabama won the national championship and Mark Ingram won the Heisman Trophy, the running back, a lot of us saw Trent Richardson as, man, this guy is going to be good. You know, he was uh, Mark Ingram's backup, but he still got a lot of carries that season. And a lot of us, I think, that were close to the program saw this coming. And this year, Trent Richardson, you know, he really uh, blossomed, I think, to close to his uh, the the top of his ability, that's for sure. You know, I want to go back to uh, Nick Saban because, as you mentioned, three national championships in the BCS. Uh, Eric talked about one of the greatest coaches ever. And But when he was with the Dolphins, which is in, you know, in between the LSU title and these two titles at Alabama, it, was, it didn't really work out so well. Uh, what do you think is the, the reason for that? How does a guy be so successful in college to win three titles and then not really make it in the NFL? You know, it's interesting. We've seen that with uh, a number of different guys, too. They get their shot at the pro. Steve Spurrier, I think, is another good example mm-hmm. uh, where it just doesn't pan out, but they're great college coaches. You know, it's it's different because uh, in a lot of ways, in, in a couple different ways, uh, first strategically, obviously the NFL is, uh, you, you know, you don't see as much of the option. Uh, it relies much more heavily on the quarterback, on the skilled players, whereas in college you can sort of, uh, uh, mix it in, you know, uh, mix in different sort of plays on offense and stuff like that that you can't use in the pros. So I think that's one reason, that sort of specialized offense. But the other reason is just simply uh, psychology. Uh, let's face it, some coaches are better with college players who are easier to control and, uh, you know, who are not um, as inclined, I would guess, I, I guess is the best word to say, to lash out. Some guys just deal with those kind of players better, players that they can control better, they can coach better under those circumstances. And I think Nick Saban uh, might be uh, one of those guys. He clashed with quite a few of his players in Miami. And listen, pro players don't want to hear it. A lot. <laughs> uh, but, but the college kid is less inclined to you know, give Nick Saban some lip back. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you're talking about a guy, an 18-, 19-year-old kid, that if he – Rubs Nick the wrong way, Nick can just say, well, you're cut from the team. See ya. And he can't yeah, really yeah. do that with the guy making five, ten million million a year. And if he does that to a college kid and suddenly his eligibility to have to pay for his schooling kicks in, he's no longer uh, uh, on scholarship if he's not on the team. Yeah, he says, you know, he's the head coach at Alabama. You can go tell him the pounds are where you know, pro <laughs> players, that's not going to happen. And not to mention also, just to harbor this point, Alabama, as of course you know, no professional teams, uh, college football kind of king in Alabama and Auburn as well. uh, The head coach of Alabama is a very powerful man in that region of the United States, correct? Nick Saban, he has more power than the governor in (laughs) Alabama. He is the most popular guy, without a doubt, uh, in the state. Him and Gene Chizik is like... uh, uh, B B plus right behind them. So if somebody uh, so wants, yeah, those two guys. I mean, they are pretty much uh, all, all of Alabama. And like you said, there's no other pro sports there. So I mean, you pop on sports radio in the summer, and they're talking about Alabama football. They're talking about somebody uh, goes on and says, you know, I saw a recruit, uh, you know, last year and blah blah blah. And they're talking about 18 year old recruits on the radio <laughs> during the summer uh, in college football, and it, it leads a lot of people to shake their heads. But when that's all you've got. Uh, you know, that's basically how it works down in Alabama. And, hey, it's worked out for them in the last three years. It's in the state, the national championship now, three years in a row. I, I just love the fact that if a, if a convicted killer is on de- who's on death row wants to get clemency, he has to go to Nick Saban. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And now, Adam, we brought up uh, Trent Richardson as uh, one of the main reasons Alabama was able to sustain success even after Heisman Trophy winner Mark Ingram left. Trent, uh, where do you see him as far as uh, playing in the NFL? Um, you know, Mark kind of had more of a back roll at the Saints, uh, partly because they have a crowded backfield. What do you see Trent doing later on in the pros? Uh, I think he can be an impact player. You know, it's interesting. He has a much bigger um, body, a bigger frame than uh, Mark Ingram. So I think he's more of a bruising sort of running back, and Mark Ingram's more of a finesse guy. I think he's a guy that can come into the NFL that will be interesting 
uh, when you get down inside the red zone, down to the 10 yard line, you can bang it in with him. Uh, but you know, he also has some breakaway speed. So I, I think he can definitely be an impact player in the NFL. I don't want to go as far as to say, uh, that he's going to be a pro bowler, uh, or that he's going to be around for a long time, or he's the next AP. But, uh, he's definitely going to get a lot of buzz, and he's going to be an early, uh, first rounder, I think. I don't think there's any question about that. Okay, so for sure he's not coming back for his senior year with the Crimson Tide. Uh, well, I, I don't think so. I would okay. say that's, pr- that's pretty safe to say. But, you, you know, you never know. Uh, Alabama uh, has a big draw to it there, and, and the college players there are treated like kings. And that's and we've seen it with uh, guys like Matt Barkley and Andrew Luck. You know, you can't get those years back. And I think mm. uh, some pro players have come out and said, you know what, man, I'm making millions of dollars, but, you know, I wish I had that one more year. So you never know. But uh, I would say the smart thing for him is to come out. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he stays in Alabama and wants to have one more shot at grabbing those lesticles. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me either. wouldn't surprise me if it goes either way. But, uh, you know, you get a lot of influential people that say take the money. But, like I said, like those names I mentioned, uh, a lot of guys, uh, you know, more often lately it seems like are deciding to stick around for one more go-round. Now, uh, Adam, I don't know if you've gone through this at some point in your, your career. Uh, I just I do this now. I mean, to find it out. Trent Richardson was born in 1990. I'm just having one of those kind of senior moments. I mean, I, I, what, what the heck? I, I know it's going to happen as time goes on, but uh, I just have one he of these still moments thinks now. He's a child. I still think I'm a child. I act like a child. And then you find <laughs> out these guys I'm covering now were born in the 90s. Uh, did, did you have one of those moments in, in your career? You know, it's funny because, you know, you get to – when I cover professional sports now, I'm 27 – uh, I'm older than most of the pro athletes right. uh, that are out there. I'm, you know, I'd be on the back end or, or in, in the later end of, of my pro career, which is interesting. So, yeah, I definitely have that. I'll tell you what, I have that even more when you go to a bar here in the States and you see that little uh, clock that they have up uh, on the side of the wall. You must be born in this year. And when the year says 1990, you go, man, I feel old. Wow, okay. All right, great. So I'm glad I'm not the only one here as well. Uh, now, you mentioned again uh, the college power that is in Alabama, Al- Alabama winning twice and Auburn in the middle there. SEC also. SEC and Auburn, you know, not to say they didn't have a good year as well. Uh, what do you look from Auburn Tigers? The Auburn Tigers coming up this year, uh, obviously, you know, a little different without Cam Newton this past season. But what do you think will happen for them in the next coming college football season? Well, I think over the next two years, uh, listen, Alabama is going to be a power to contend with because, uh, you know, f- for the foreseeable future because their recruiting classes have been spectacular. Auburn's done that as well. Auburn has done a fantastic job in Gene Shizik of creating a lot of excitement around that program. They've had top-ranked recruiting classes as well. Now, then again, we've seen a lot of those not pan out. Charlie Weiss had a lot of great recruiting classes at Notre Dame. But I think both of those schools are really going to just – are. Uh, have been putting together the great classes. They'll continue to compete uh, at high levels in the NCC. And I think both of those coaches, which is interesting because there's been a lot of uh, turnover uh, prior to Saban and Chizik as far as coaches. Yeah, well, well, Auburn had Tuberville for a while. But I think these two guys that we have are probably among the two best leaders that the teams have had in their eras. Uh, uh, you know, in their program's history. So I think these two guys will be around for a while, and they'll both continue to c- compete. Without a doubt. I, I got to ask you uh, your thoughts on this whole debacle. You, the, the national title game was a rematch of an earlier season game between LSU and Alabama. Now, a lot of right, people right. did not believe Alabama should have been given the opportunity to play against LSU because, well, pretty much they, they lost to them already once in the season, and it possibly should have gone to Oklahoma State. You know, I'm not going to say Boise State. They did lose, and, you know, there's a, there's a whole lot in that. I, I, I like Boise State. I root for them, but I didn't think that they really deserved it. But Oklahoma State, at least, should have gone up against LSU, especially after the showing in their bowl game. What do you see with the BCS for the for its future? Most likely it's going to stay as it is, but should there be a true and proper consideration for some change of the way it is settled? Well, you know, it's interesting because I talked to Bill Hancock, who's the um, executive director of the BCS at the championship game last year, and he had a press conference, well, it was more, more of a luncheon, I would say, for media members uh, where he answered questions, and he just got skewered up there. I mean, you could tell based on the questions that, you know, folks just don't like the system. 
in the last week or so, uh, the BCS has come out and they've said all things are on the table. Uh, you know, that they're. I think what we're going to see, and we could see it as early as next year, I think it's very possible, is the plus one system where you have two national semifinals uh, and then a championship game. In a perfect world, you know, I would love to have the 16-team playoff. You know, I think it's a joke that the, the fact that the Division Three, Division Two, Division uh, the FCS, formerly 1AA, the fact that they can all have playoff systems and the fact that, uh, you know, FBS, you know, formerly just Division One A, can't do it. It doesn't make any sense to me. And, you know, we have all these bowls. We've got a million bowl games, uh, you know, that are all pointless. We've got six and six teams playing, six and seven teams playing in some cases. You know, right. we could create, we could hold on to these bowls and have them be the earlier rounds of the playoffs. You could have your BCS bowls be the final four and, and, and still have the championship game. There's still a lot of money to be made there. And, you know, people worry about the regular season. Well, that. Uh, you know, will that diminish the regular season? You know, they say we have the best regular season in college in, in sports. Yeah, but you have the worst postseason in sports. So I think if change is going to come, it's going to come slowly, and it could come as soon as next year. Um, but, uh, you know, there's still a lot of presidents and people that run bowls that do not want to see a playoff system, and that's why you're not going to see it. Well, I, I'm totally up for a playoff system. They they got a whole what three four weeks between the end of the regular season and when these right, these right. heavy bowl games are played. There's definitely time for the teams for the, such a system to be put in place without having to extend or exacerbate the current system, rather the current season that's in place. Yeah, and and you got a lot of college presidents and coaches that'll come out with this argument where they say, well, you know, we don't want to keep the kids, put them through the games, and they could get injured. Come on. I mean, they're doing it in all the other divisions. All right, that's that's a complete sham. They're already playing games on Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. It's a college football game on smaller division every night, you know? So so don't give me the don't give me the garbage about uh, missing class time and stuff like that. You know, if they should do it, they should do it right just like they're doing in the other division. By the way, whatever it's worth to the people listening out there. Any college kid will tell you he much rather play in a game than play practice. And that month before the bowl game, they're in practice anyway. So from yeah. their perspective, they'd rather just be in the game. Yeah, oh, no doubt about it. And I can remember asking uh, a lot of all the players at last year's national championship, most of the players want to play. Now, yes, yes, the coaches, oh, you know, we like the system, and here's Auburn in the national championship. Of course they're going to say they like the system. <laughs> right. But you talk to the players, especially with a mic away from them, and they would love to, I think, have a playoff system. All right, uh, Adam, last question before I let you go. Now, you're in New England right now, is that correct? That is true, yes. And big game, of course. Uh, Tim Tebow and the Denver Broncos take on the New England Patriots. Uh, what are your thoughts on the ball game this weekend? Well, well I'm excited. You know, um, I, I was thinking the other day, man, you know, if I was still down in Alabama, I would have been in New Orleans last night covering the game. But instead, uh, as you mentioned, I've recently moved in an NBC affiliate uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, so I'll be covering the Tebow Fest uh, <laughs> tomorrow. And, uh, you know, it's going to be crazy. It was already exciting the last time Tebow came here. But, but uh, let's face it. That was only because of the SNL. Patriots. I'm sorry? That was only because of Saturday Night Live skit that was done right before. Oh, the Saturday Night Live skit was fantastic. <laughs> yes, uh, it was. But, but I'll tell you what, speaking of a gift from God, uh, that's what the Patriots got, the Broncos winning last week, because I was really nervous with them against the Steelers. Yeah. But I just don't think T- Tim Tebow... Uh, is going to be able to is going to be able to get it done in Foxborough. Not to mention the fact that Tom Brady is having such a spectacular, unbelievable year, and he's sort of been third in the depth chart because Aaron Rodgers and Drew Brees have been insanely uh, have had insanely good years. Yeah, so, it's um, uh, yeah. I just think the Patriots. I think they're going to win pretty handily by a couple touchdowns for sure. You know, it's weird to throw over five thousand yards and be kind of under the radar, but that's kind of what happened with Tom this year, hasn't it? And also with Matt yeah. Stafford, but that's just a side note. Yeah, yeah, and no doubt about it. And he's had a spectacular year as he's had uh, at any point in his career, and, and he has, I think, uh, to some extent, flown under the radar because of what uh, Breeze has done and what. Aaron Rodgers is done, and, uh, you know, hey, it always benefits the Patriots when they fly into the radar, that's for sure. And the fact that it will be Tebow mania, that helps the Patriots as well, uh, without a doubt. You know, they've always played good in the playoffs when they were the underdog. Look how they've done when they've been the favorite. Not very good. 
uh, when they've been the team that isn't favored or the team that's not getting all the attention, they've done much better for sure. Adam, you got a real tough gig, my man, covering college football in the state of Alabama and now covering the Patriots in the New England area. It's, it's pretty rough, huh? I know. Hey, life is good, right? <laughs> Amen, brother. All right, uh, we got to run. We know you're very busy uh, doing uh, all the football stuff out there. It's going to be a great weekend. We're really looking forward to it, and we're very, very happy to have you back on the program on IsraelSportsRadio.com. All right, guys, best to you. You have a good one. You, you too, too, Adam. Be well. Take care.